Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Ferguson. I'm the acting head of the College of Humanities and Social Science. It's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the third of this session's Gifford Lectures from Professor Michael Gazaniga from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, Professor Gazaniga has been attracting good audiences to these lectures. Tonight is no exception. An increasing attendance is a sign of a successful series of Giffords, and I'm delighted to welcome so many of you to the Playfair Library. The series title this year is The Science of Mind Constraining Matter. Tonight is Lecture 3, entitled The Interpreter, and I ask you all to welcome again Professor Gazaniga. Thank you. It's a pleasure again to be here, and uh, let's see where we go. This is, the, this is the heart of the lecture series right here, so uh, you came to the right one. Uh, <clears throat> so where were we? we? We last couple of lectures, we pointed out and argued for our, our functionality is largely automatic. We have distributed local control working in parallel under no apparent central command center, even though it seems to be that. And tonight we're going to, realizing the vast extent of the uh, importance of the brain's subconscious processes, discovering the left brain interpreter, which is the heart, as I said, and how it provides our more apparent and real sense of psychological unity. And then we're going to move towards the, an assessment of the implications of that interpreter, which I call living in a post hoc world. So uh, again, as before, uh, these summary statements uh, are framing. They don't mean much now. They, hopefully they will mean something after I go through the uh, presentation. And we've been talking, as I said, about all these distributed systems. And, and uh, just I wanted to point out that the networks, the human networks that uh, are known to be there but haven't been studied I have now, are now being studied beautifully and elegantly because of new technologic demands, uh, which are actually also here at the University of Edinburgh, quite a fascinating uh, set of work using the, this diffusion tensor analysis to analyze these networks. And also the re-computation of where those, how those networks may be organized is seen in the picture on the right, uh, where we see that can begin to see the density of the projections and point out where some areas are more interconnected than other. This is just by way of saying that the science keeps moving forward on identifying these things that we know are there, but we haven't quite figured out their total organization by any means. So you have a system where you have local uh, areas of capacity in the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere. We have uh, uh, specific systems that seem to be integrated across the brain from the uh, integrating information from both the left and the right brain. And, um, and more interestingly, uh, recently it's been discovered that uh, if you want to just think about your mind wandering, which is uh, <clears throat> something that I know a lot about, uh, you have a whole set of networks now that are being identified as maybe subserving that, that time when we're just sitting idly thinking about the millions of things that come up. And these are called the default networks. And they're now being captured with brain imaging. And here's a dynamic picture of one which just goes to show that through time, all of this, of course, we, we tend to think of, of the brain as this static thing. There's an input, there's a process, and there's an output, and you know, let's try to capture that. It's a constant, moving, crazy, wonderful system. That's what we're trying to understand when we have this, this sense of, uh, of individual psychological unity. So I'm going to begin with uh, this problem, which uh, uh, is that we always seem to find uh, the homunculus. We always think that there is something uh, that is pulling the levers, as I said in the first lecture, that is driving, uh, driving the system that we think uh, is us. And I'm going to show you a little clip here uh, on a Calliope on the Mississippi River, and you can, see, you can see the homunculus unfold. It looks like it's something else, but in fact there is a homunculus and it's kind of fun. Keep your eye 
on the boat. Zooming in on her. There she is. There's the homunculus playing with the organ. <laughs> so, as Marvin Minsky said, any model, any cognitive mo model of how the mind works, look for the box that thinks. And that is the idea of the homunculus. There's always the system in there. But what we have to move to is the idea that it's distributed and automatic, and we can build machines without a homunculus. So that's what we're trying to understand, and I've belabored this point enough. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so, so we have all these systems. What pulls it together into this sense of unity that we have? And this is what we've called uh, over the years the interpreter. There's something in the left hemisphere of you and me that see, tries to seek the pattern and understand our behaviors that pour forth from all of these distributed systems in us and pull it into a single narrative that we come to think of uh, as ourself. And uh, how does it work? Well, first of all, we have to recognize there are all these automatic and unconscious processes that are being interpreted and are, uh, and are responsible for our behavior. So we have obviously automatic processes at the level of the genome and our cells, uh, at this level of systems neurophysiology. There's all these things are going on automatically and they can even go on and be captured uh, all the way up to uh, the brain imaging level that you see on top. So we have this little bit of consciousness on top and this vast system underneath us doing all the heavy computing that allows us to do anything. And there's a need for this automaticity. The evolutionary rationale for processes becoming automatic are simple. Consciousness takes time, and we don't have time. We have lots of things to have to do quickly. We have to react to them. They have to be automatic. And to give you an example of that, if I ask you to, if I put you in front of a screen and a light flashes on and you have to hit a button as soon as you can after the light comes on, all of us in the room after uh, a, a lot of practice will get down to about uh, 220 milliseconds. Uh, that's, that's kind of the base speed in, uh, in a visual light uh, reaction time experiment. And now I say to you, so I got you down there, you're responding about 220 milliseconds, and I say, okay, just slow it down a little bit. Kind of try and shoot for 240, 250, something like that. Well, now you're consciously monitoring your motor behavior, and you can't. What happens is your score jumps up, your reaction time jumps up to 550 milliseconds. You've put consciousness in the loop. And of course, every great athlete, every great musician knows that. And they, they try to keep it at the automatic level because once you consciously intervene, you throw off your timing and things don't work as well as they could. And uh, the, this, the process, the conscious process are expensive with large memory loads. So we, want, we try to make them rule driven and automatic. We're driving towards this. And I'm gonna give you two examples of it. One a built in in the area of perceptual judgment. This is something that just over time and evolutionary time has, has been built into us and then uh, ones that we learn. And this is a famous illusion produced by Roger Shepard uh, many years ago. It's called the uh, turning tables illusion. And the, the, what I'm trying to illustrate is that uh, these tabletops are exactly the both, uh, the, both same, uh, same shape and area. Now, there's nobody in the room who believes that. That's preposterous. And if you put these in your introductory textbook, you will find the students will cut the page out because they don't believe it. And they want it, and they cut the thing out. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show you how it works. Astounding, every time I see it. So there you go. So why is that? Well, the brain is automatically computing here about what it perceives to be the length due to cues that are presented there in the drawing, and it's adding corrections, 
And it's doing all of that, and you can't do anything about it. In fact, they actually know where in the brain uh, this sort of thing goes on. But it's automatic, built in, and present. And uh, then you think about learned things that become automatic. So if we all have learned to type now, and some of us learn to type quite quickly, and some of us can even type without thinking. <laughs> and we've read a few of those books. So, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, if, 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 if we all type like this. And now I say, where's the S on the, oh, wait, where's the S? And then you think and you can, you can find it. So we want to get all this stuff automated out of consciousness. That is consciousness. That is what becoming an expert uh, really is. And, uh, it's an interesting one. I, I just want to throw this in because it's so interesting and, and it illustrates the point. This is the variability amongst the radiologists in detecting uh, tumors in, in uh, breast cancer. And as you can see, some people are pretty good and some people uh, aren't so good. And uh, what makes an expert? Well, here are, here are uh, scans of uh, an examination of a breast uh, uh, for, for, for breast cancer and which uh, which is the expert and which is the uh, novice in this? You know, right? It is, the novice is over here because they don't know where to look. They haven't been automated yet. They haven't looked at hundreds and thousands of these things. And the expert just takes one big, quick look at it and goes right to the tumor. Because somehow the pattern recognition system in his brain has been trained. He sees the variables and he knows. He just automatically it goes to it. So. Uh, so with all this complex, uh, these complex systems going on subconsciously, we come to the point of saying, okay, how, if this, all this is, is going on and, and in a diversified, distributed way, how come we feel uh, unified? Well, this, this takes us to a new set of patients, a new set of split brain patients. I told you a lot about the original California series of patients. Uh, then there was the Dartmouth series of patients, and now there's a, there was an Ohio series of patients that we studied, a, a series of patients that came out of uh, Yale Medical School. And uh, there's a new series of patients now, and we'll hear more about them at the end of the uh, second, uh, fifth lecture on, uh, out of Italy, uh, a very fascinating set of group of patients. And uh, to study these, these patients in the United States, uh, we needed to hit the road and uh, this is a little scientific side story. My colleague and great student, uh, Joseph Ledoux, uh, helped on this. We decided that we had to rid ourselves from this old van with this trailer when, as we drove around New England on icy roads to go to the patient's house to test them. And we had always fantasized about owning a GMC Eleganza, the real deal, right? So we put a grant application into the National Science Foundation for salary and the thing and uh, all this kind of stuff. And you know how these numbers add up. And uh, I came to write the bus, it came time to write the budget justification. And I brought in uh, uh, my student, Joseph, uh, who writes like a dream, great scientist and writes like a dream. And I said, Joseph, could you write the budget justification for this kind of swanky van? And he said, sure. So he writes this thing and you send it off to the, the government and uh, Nine months later, I get a phone call saying, well, congratulations, you've been awarded the grant. I said, oh, well, that's really exciting. He said, well, actually, you've been awarded a part of the grant. I said, well, we're awarding you the van. <laughs> you have to pay for everything else. So, uh, so then it, one had to learn how to drive the van in New York, where we were based at the time. And very interesting, one had to learn how to park it on 68th Street down a driveway. I just want you to know it's a complete picture the complete efforts that go into the, this uh, highfalutin research. And, uh, and inside the van, these are our colleagues, John Sittis and Jeff Holtzman, and we had to convert the van to carry a very sophisticated set of equipment uh, and take the stuff that was very easily set up in a laboratory in a, in a, in a regular building and make it, make it mobile. And of course, then uh, I have to embarrass my wife, who uh, was the real brick behind the whole enterprise, not only uh, running the experiments, driving the van, but also cooking the several meals that we ate on the road. So uh, she's here, Charlotte. There you go. So here are, the, here, here are the original series of patients that we talked about and we saw from Caltech, but then new patients came along, the East Coast series, Case PS, Case JW, Case VP, Case DR, Case EB, to mention uh, many of them. 
These are patients all having their brains divided in an effort to control their epileptic seizures. And all of them would show the following phenomenon, just to summarize what I said last time, that uh, if you showed a split brain patient uh, this uh, array of information, they fixated the point, and the word uh, ring would be presented in the right visual field going to their left speaking hemisphere, they would say out loud, just like you and I would, ring. And then the word key, going in the left visual field to the right hemisphere, is going into a hemisphere that does not have speech, but can feel its way around the world through its left hand, and it can go find the correct object. So you get this dramatic separation and disconnection effect, and that's true for all the, all the patients. And these patients uh, have been studied uh, on any of a number of tests for, for 40 years, uh, the, whole, the whole research program. And uh, about 25 years in, we asked ourselves the question, you know, what did these patients feel like when we kind of sneak into their right hemisphere and tell the left hand to do something? You know, it's, it's kind of like you're all sitting there now and all of a sudden you see your hand do something. What, what, you know, how do you, what do you say to yourself about that? How do you integrate that into you, where you are? And so, literally, after 25 years, we finally set up a test to say, we should ask the patients how they think about this sort of stuff. And so what we did was give what we called a simple concept test. And this is where we flash a picture, again, here in the right visual field going to the left hemisphere, a picture of, say, a chicken claw. And then we have four choices out in front of the patient's right hand, the, the right hand getting its control from the left hemisphere. And uh, the correct choice, choice, of course, would be the chicken would go with the chicken claw. It makes perfect sense, very simple little test. And then to the disconnected right hemisphere, we show a picture of a snow scene. And the most uh, appropriate answer for the snow scene would be the shovel, okay? So we flash these pictures, and uh, the patient is to pick the most appropriate uh, answer, and the hands go out, as you see in the cartoon. So the left hemisphere picks the chicken claw, and the right hemisphere picks the shovel. So the patient's doing this. They're sitting there pointing to these things. And we said, in this case, Paul, why did you do that? And he said, oh, that's simple. The chicken claw goes with the chicken, and then looking down at his left hand, pointing at this shovel, he says, and you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shit. <laughs> so immediately, immediately put into a context, an explanation for why a hand uh, uh, that moved, that uh, came from his body, did something that it did. And uh, we have uh, umpteen examples of these. Let me, let me give you a few to really, re really deepen the point. Here's another case, uh, JW uh, uh, doing a similar task. To the word. Again, Joe sees two words simultaneously. Bell goes to his non-speaking right brain. Music to his speaking left brain. When asked to point to a picture of what he saw, he chooses Bell. But when asked why... Yeah, why'd you pick that one? Music. Music. And when asked to explain... It was music and Bell. And it was a few minutes ago, the last time I heard any music was coming from the bells out here. Uh -huh. Banging away. So the bells yeah. outside here? So... Look good enough answer to me. What's extraordinary is that Joe's speaking left brain concocts a plausible story of why he pointed to Bell, even when some of the other pictures more obviously represent music. So here's another example where now uh, we're in our van and we're flashing the word red to the left hemisphere and the word banana to the right hemisphere. So we're flashing red to the speaking hemisphere. And in front of him is a piece of paper and five or six colored pens, one of which is red. And we just kind of loosely say, you know, just draw what you see. And here's what he does. Okay. He picks the red pen, that's the left hemisphere, making an easy decision.
What do you got there? A oh, banana. Red. She red anyway. Yeah. The other one, banana. Fruit, one or the other. <laughs> hey. Okay. Good. It's good drawing. Okay, I couldn't think of how else you was going to draw a red thing, so I grabbed a red pen. It was the first time I've seen a color on me. Why did you pick banana? I'm just the easiest to draw with this hand, because this hand can pull down easier. Like that. Okay. Here's another, Case PS. We ask him, uh, I'm going to give you two more illustrations of this, because I really want to bring this home. Case PS says, uh, we say to him, uh, who is your favorite? We can just say that. And then we lateralize to the right hemisphere, the last phrase, uh, girlfriend. Who is your girlfriend? Right? So both hemisphere here, who is, but only the right hemisphere hears the last part of it, girlfriend. And then he has to arrange a series of Scrabble letters he has in front of him to spell out uh, the answer. What would you say? Put your hands flat, okay? Flat to the Your favorite? I didn't get that one. I didn't get that one. I didn't get that one. Huh? I didn't get that one. I didn't get it. Try spelling, but maybe you shouldn't do it. No way. So he then goes on to, to spell out the, his girlfriend's name. Uh, and what that communicates is that, that he, the emotional reaction to that was such that he depicted the, he had the right emotional response, but he could, couldn't tell you why. And he formed his response the way he did because of a teenager being embarrassed about talking about his girlfriend and so forth. So uh, the, the, these these examples wait a minute, these examples go on and on. And um, and uh, my colleague George Wolford and I did an experiment a few years back, and, and Michael Miller as well, uh, where we wanted to ask the question: Could we take a a simple test and show that the left hemisphere is just different? Uh, in how it wants to see the world analyzed versus the right hemisphere. And uh, we called upon a classic uh, paradigm in experimental psych uh, psychology, whether people do what is called probability matching or maximize. And what it, this test is really simple. Let's say you're fixating a point and we're, I'm asking you to, to guess whether a light comes above the point or below the point. And that's just a game and you gotta sit there and guess and then it happens and then you're either right or wrong. And, uh, and so uh, what happens is you can manipulate this so that the light always comes on, say, 80% above the line and only 20% below the line. Now, if you are a rat, you quickly figure out to always say above because that way if you maximize you, and you push the top panel 100% of the time, you're going to get rewarded 80% of the time. So you're going to come away with the goods, as it were. If you go to the University of Edinburgh, on the other hand, or any other college, even though you're 20th, uh, you will try to guess the system. You will try to figure out the pattern of lights. And in trying to figure that pattern out, your score drops to about 67%. Okay, so you try to outsmart the system, turns out you can't. We apply this to the split brain, Turns out the right hemisphere is a maximizer. The left hemisphere is the probability match. It's always trying to figure out the pattern. And that's what it seems that the left hemisphere and this interpretive system, what does this mean? How does it fit in? Where does it go? How's it part of my narrative? And, and so forth. And you, once you're onto it, you, you can then see its application and implications for, for many studies. This is a study uh, from a number of years ago uh, out of the social psychological literature. And it's about how people respond to uh, other people when they, th when they uh, fear that uh, they may have an uh, abnormality in their, in their physical body. So what they did is they took normal undergraduate sophomores and they put a kind of a goopy thing on their cheek. 
And they said, okay, uh, we're going to have you interview this other subject, and we want you to see what it's like maybe to have a, a handicap of some kind, I guess is the idea. And we want, to, want you to analyze how they are treating you because of that. We, and we're trying to come to an understanding of these phenomena. And the students say, fine, they understand this, and, and so forth. And then just before they go in for the interview, the, the experimenters very, very slickly take the goop off, actually. They say they're gonna, they gotta put on some material to make it stick there, but what actually they do is wipe it completely clean. So there's nothing on the student's face, but the student doesn't realize that. They think they've got the goop on their, on their face. Every student goes into this thing, they're, they're uh, interviewed, they carry out this interview with the other person, and that all goes as planned, and they come out and they're analyzed, and they're interviewed by the experimenter. And the experimenter says, well, how was it? And they said, oh, it was terrible. I had no idea how people are treated with, uh, with, with a handicap. That is just horrible. And the experimenter says, really? He says, yeah, it was just, it's unbelievable. He says, well, you know, we actually filmed the person you were interviewing, and could, could, we would like to play that film for you, and could you point out to us what parts you found that they were responding to your... Well, so they start the film up, and uh, you know, it gets a second into the film, they say, stop, see that? Look, look the way they're diverting their eyes here. Ah, it's because of this goop on my chin, and so forth. So you could, you could just see this thing that we have. It's constantly trying to figure out, explain the world by what we think is the current status of our cognitive state, and so forth, and so on. So, um, the, this interpreter then can produce, uh, it, it works in, in, in many ways, it, 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 it grasps the gist of uh, a situation. This is, this is a common thing for you, and, uh, for you and me to do, is we go in a situation, like we might go into a, a faculty meeting, <laughs> and say, well, this is a typical faculty meeting, and kind of then tune out for the next three hours, right? Because we know kind of the content, the pattern, and so forth and so on. And then when we're asked about it three days later, they say, well, what was that meeting you went to from at one o'clock? Well, it was a faculty meeting. And then you start just plugging stuff into the generic faculty meeting that you've come to, to know about. So, uh, so you can do this experimentally. Yeah, and here's a, you take a, a, a story, say about 40 pictures, and it's a little story of, of someone waking up in the morning, uh, getting dressed, uh, putting their clothes on, having coffee, going to work, and so forth. So it's, it's a very simple storyline. And then what you do is you test uh, people who ha have this storyline on the actual pictures that were presented called the studied pictures. Uh, distractor pictures not related to the story have nothing to do with the story. Or distractor pictures that were related to the story, but actually you did not see them, okay? And then you test people on this, and of course what you and I do is we're good at get getting the study pictures, and we also incorporate into that all these related pictures, and we're good at throwing out the, the distractors. But we bring in the, the distractor but related pictures. We say, yeah, 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 I was about that. Yeah, sure, that, I must have seen that. Well, you do that with respect to hemispheres, and what you find is the right hemisphere is totally veridical. It doesn't do any of this. It, it doesn't seem to interpret anything. It just hands back to you exactly what it saw, and it does it more accurately than the left hemisphere. And the left hemisphere uh, acts like you and I do, which is that it counts the related pictures as well as the ones actually seen. So uh, the interpreter is is an extremely busy system, and uh, we mentioned this uh, at the end of uh, uh, Tuesday's talk about how does it play out in the emotions, emotional sphere. And uh, these were a series of studies we did, uh, and this particular case is on VP, uh, one of our patients, and the subject was placed in an eye tracking device so that you could show a movie for a long period of time to one hemisphere or the other. And here we're showing a movie uh, to the left visual field, right hemisphere, and it's a very scary movie, it's about what happens if Someone gets pushed into a fire, and it's a very arousing movie. It's, it's, part, of a, it's part of a film safety, a fire safety program uh, film. And uh, anyway, so we showed it to VP, and then it's off, and then afterwards we just interview her. And we say, uh, I don't 
I, I didn't really, I said, what did you see? And I said, I don't really know what I saw. I think just a white flash. That's the typical left here hemisphere response. Doesn't know what went on in the right hemisphere. Then the experimenter says, were there people in it? I don't think so. Maybe just some trees, red trees, like in the fall. Uh, did it make you feel any emotion? I don't really know why, but I'm kind of scared. I feel jumpy. I think maybe I don't like this room, or maybe it's you. You're getting me nervous. VP turned to the female experimenter and private said, I know I like Dr. Kazani, but right now I'm scared of him for some reason. And so the notion is that there's your interpreter going along, you know, and then boom, something fires off that tilts your emotional system one way or the other, and then you have to give it an interpretation. You can't let it sit there. And so you start picking up cues from the environment. We talked about panic attacks last time. You, you try to explain this different and emotional state that's been triggered by your, uh, uh, a brain system that's separate from the one that's interpreting. And here's an example uh, of, of a uh, case NG uh, showing this phenomenon. She was, uh, just, she was simply in a task where all she was trying to do was name what she saw, and so we, uh, flash her uh, a picture in her left visual field, right hemisphere of a spoon. We say, what did you see? And she would say, nothing. That's the typical response, right? And then we threw in a, a pinup picture. What did you see? And then you asked her why, and she would talk about uh, well, you guys are, you've got a funny machine there, and make up some, some story. So that's what we do. That's what we're doing all day long. We're interpreting, we're trying to figure out the outputs, we're trying to synthesize it into a common uh, narrative. Now this stuff can go on within the brain, and you can see this captured in it by a fluke. Uh, Actually, VP has a, a sparing of the anterior part of the callosum. You can see right there, a little white dot on the scan. And this gives rise to an unbelievable uh, phenomenon in her. Uh, it allows for the transfer of printed words, the meaning of printed words. So here's what, here's what you have. So if you, here's a fully, completely split patient. No, no fiber saved at all, fully split. This is case JW. And we fl flash the words uh, scraper to the right hemisphere and the word sky to the left. Now what you and I would do uh, if asked to pull, to draw something that, uh, from what, what was presented, we would draw an Empire State Building, a tall skyscraper. What JW does is draw a scraper and a sky scene, because what's happening is each hemisphere is just taking control of the hand and drawing what it saw. There's no integration of information because of the full split brain uh, event. The same task, different, different stimuli, same task presented to, to a VP, headstone, out comes a picture of a tombstone. Got it, what, he said, what's this? Is this transfer? I mean, she's split, she's not supposed to transfer. So, of course, you chase this down, and you have her fixate a point, and then you put shapes of different size between a hemisphere. Can she match them? No, she can't. Uh, shapes of different kinds of shapes? No, she can't do that. Colors? She can't match colors between a hemisphere. So it doesn't look like a simple transfer of, of visual information from one side to the other. If you give her a match-to-sample task where you have a red square in one hemisphere, and the choice is a red square or a green uh, ball, she can't do that task, a chance. But if you print out the word red square, for some reason there is a communication and a, an ability to integrate this information within the hemispheres. So, astonishingly, there's, you've got to keep in this queuing, high, uh, intense self-queuing system that neurologic patients of all kinds have, and in particular in the split brain, you got to always be on the lookout. Is there integration or is there, or, or is there integration outside the body or is it inside the body? And here's JW where the information is always outside the body, but you can see how clever uh, and quick the body is to, re to make things seem like they're doing the task. And uh, so in this task here, where JW is quite an artist, 
And uh, we're flashing the word car to his left hemisphere so he could say it if he asked him, what'd you see, car? And we're flashing uh, the, the year 1928 to the right hemisphere. What'd you see? He didn't say anything. It's a typical split brain. So then we just say, so we flash car to the left hemisphere, 1928 to the right hemisphere. Say, so just draw what you see. Okay? So here he is, drawing what he sees. Now, I hope this can be seen. It's, it's kind of a, it's a homemade video, but... It, it comes, I think it comes clear here as the camera uh, zooms in. There it is, a 1928 car. Now, somehow, in the drawing, both hemispheres are, are cooperating in some way uh, in controlling the motor output such that he can take a car, which he, and he can draw, if I had put 1955, he would add a Chevrolet uh, Malibu in there. He, he's, he's, he's a car expert. And uh, somehow this integration seemingly you would think might be going on inside the head, but actually it's going on in the piece of paper in front of you. And uh, these are just two other samples uh, that, that, that say the same thing. So, so this interpreter uh, uh, and this system to, uh, that's always at work explaining uh, events that uh, are pouring out of the parallel distributed system but raises the question, is, is it in the right hemisphere too? Well, the evidence is that no, not the kind that we've been describing here where it's putting an explanation and trying to seek the pattern of meaning of output. That's not in the right hemisphere. It seems localized to the left hemisphere. But the right hemisphere does have some kind of visual interpreter. It's the, it, it is the whiz kid on perceptual grouping of taking stimuli like that and being able to see that in fact there's a cube embedded uh, in those uh, uh, random uh, Pac-Man uh, uh, pictures. And uh, you can uh, do test after test and have this pointed out, the right hemisphere uh, is specialized for this, whereas the, the left hemisphere uh, is not. You can take the, what are called Gollum figures. These are figures that uh, first only lightly suggest what an object may be, then it becomes more complete, and then finally the full object is presented and here again, the right hemisphere detects and is able to identify what these things are way before the left hemisphere is. The left hemisphere can finally do it when it's, when it's fully drawn out, but as it's trying to pull together and group the information into a meaning, it's the right hemisphere that is superior. And in this simple tax, uh, uh, what's, what's now going to happen is I'm going to flash a long line and you're going to group it automatically. You watch this. You think it's coming from uh, the uh, left side of the screen, the side that matches the line. Then the next one, uh, it's the opposite, of course. What, what is that? What, why do you group it and assume when that light's just coming on simultaneously, it's not going across the page as you, uh, the screen as you see it? Why is that happening? Again, it's this perceptual grouping. And a series of these things have been worked out by uh, Paul Corbelis uh, in our lab a number of years ago, and he's continued to really develop this idea in a, in a beautiful way. So this, this becomes interesting. If this right, right hemisphere is uh, really good at kind of apprehending complex patterns and gets automatic about it, uh, maybe we could see it uh, uh, 
uh, unfold in uh, the study of chess, a, 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 wonderful, uh, a wonderful example that have, has been uh, studied in many, many times by cognitive scientists, starting with uh, de Groot uh, in, in the first, where he pointed out that if you show a, a grandmaster like uh, Patrick Wolf here, uh, you, if you show him a card with chessmen on it, 27 chessmen on it or so, that uh, make perfect chess sense, he can get 24 of the 27, I forget what the number is, I have it written down here. It only makes two errors. Uh, and he can, he can just, you show that card for five seconds and then put it down and he can just construct the board, just what it was. If you and I can be really good chess players, we get about five. We're not, we're not a grandmaster or a master level. And here, here he is doing it, just so you see it. So these are very cleverly chosen, I think, because it's clear that this one is obviously much easier to construct pawn chain, for example, it's just all one big glob. Although, um, once again, I'm sure, I'm always not sure what, what to do with this guy, you know? Um, I'm not sure whether it's here or here. Um, oh, I forgot my rook. I think it's here. Okay. All right. Now, the same guy is shown the same number of chessmen, but it makes no chess sense, right? It's just random kind of positioning. And he's, we just want to see if he has an incredible visual memory or he's calling upon hundreds of thousands of games with templates are developed and, and uh, groupings have been worked through and, and they've become automatic and, and, uh, and, and so forth. And so here he is uh, trying to do this with a, a, a card that demonstrates just as many chess men, but it makes no chess sense. Why can't I remember it? I see it, and I try to cluster these things, and I can't friggin' remember it after the card goes away. There's like something here. There's like a cluster of pieces here, and there's a cluster of pieces here, but. There's a cluster of pieces here, and there's a cluster of pieces here, okay? I can tell you that. How's that? <laughs> okay. So, Chris Chabri and, 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 and Hamilton did some. Uh, beautiful studies, and, and just to summarize them quickly, it turns out that the, uh, in, uh, uh, when testing uh, how quick we are in responding to these issues in the visual fields and therefore the hemispheres, there's a tremendous right hemisphere advantage in understanding uh, chest positions. And uh, so the model then is that what we're, what we're dealing with is that in a person like uh, 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 Wolf, that his pattern perceptual mechanisms are all coded, they're all automatic, they're all in his right hand, it's just doing it. It's just doing it. But now uh, we ask him about it. So tell us about this hot shot talent you have. And uh, here's where you see the interpreter. Uh, I guess that should be struggling, not struggling, but maybe. <laughs> what I is just sort of absorb the position um, and understand um, where everything was clustered and, and try to quickly understand what was going on, um, establish some logical connections between things. And occasionally, um, I've never done, I, I've, I've almost never done this sort of thing before, so I don't have a good sense of how much time different things are going to take me. Um, but the important thing is to try to make it. Yeah, so that was all very reasonable. Now, this is where he really tries to uh, explain. Uh, his ability to, to do the original uh, 
uh, arrangement of the chest. And this sort of goes right away because the pond structure is like this. And um, this is a little bit tricky, actually, because white is just going to win by playing bishop a7. And that sort of dominates everything. So like, that's why I can't remember where this rook is very well, because the most important thing is this and this and this pawn structure and this is happening. And it's just sort of hard to, to sort of pay attention to the rest because, like, if black does this, you're just going to stop the pawn like that, then you're going to play the, this next move, or you might even just be able to do this, you know, because queens, and then you just take here, and it's just over because queens is happening. So um, that's just sort of, you, you, you sort of get it by trying to, to understand what's going on quickly. And, and of course, you chunk things, right? I mean, obviously, um, these pawns just, but, but it's, I mean, you chunk things in their normal way. Like, I mean, one person might think this is sort of a structure, but actually I would think this is more the, all the pawns like this, and this is a unit, and um, you just sort of try to quickly. So, you get it. Pattern seeking for understanding in the left depends on the data supplied to it, changes moment to moment, and in the right hemisphere is getting these part-whole relationships it understands uh, the visual part of the task, it gets it done, but when the left tries to explain it, uh, it's hard sledding. So you come up with this idea that, that, uh, that what the interpreter, the interpreter is only as good as the data that it gets. So if you feed it incorrect data, or if you hijack the brain in some way, you're going to get a different story out of the interpreter than might, you might otherwise get. And you can see this in uh, studying normal brains, and I'm going to give you an illustration of it, and you can see it very commonly in neurologic syndromes. So first of all, the idea here is that maybe, maybe all our reality, right, every second, is in a sense virtual. That we're depending on the sensory cues that we're here present now, and it's guiding our whole system, we're giving an interpretation. And I like to point out that when we're in an airplane, it, 37,000 feet flying 600 miles an hour and uh, having a cup of coffee, and we think that's normal. You know, that's crazy, you know? I mean, you're, you're basically uh, winging it. And so, uh, so if, you, if you take, uh, for those of you who have had this experience, you'll know what I'm talking about, but for those of you who have not, I'm gonna try and mimic it here. If you take uh, a virtual reality goggles, these are things that you, you put on and you see the world through these special goggles. So I could be looking at you at the audience, but there would be a computer actually between me and you, and, you could, and the guy at the computer could be doing tricks on me. And a very simple one, uh, this is what these things look like, I just wanted to show that. A very a simple one is uh, uh, to put on these goggles, and this is done by my uh, colleague at Santa Barbara, Jim Blaskovich. And you're in his laboratory. You know you're in his laboratory. You know you're at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And you're sitting there walking in his lab, which you know has a cement floor. And now these goggles are on you. You're hijacked like that. You walk along, and all of a sudden, the floor opens up. Big hole. You jump back. Your heart goes up. You're scared. Everybody in the room's laughing at the other end, you know, because they, they got you. And then, uh, and then they put a gangplank across the hole so that you can walk if you want to across this thing. There is no way you're, you're going to walk across this thing. So here's how he tried to capture this for me in a uh, video. This is sort of how it looks. And uh, you're just not going to go across that gangplank because it, it's really effective uh, uh, and it's hard to captured here in this, this sort of thing, but maybe you get the idea. So you can, the, your interpretation of the world, what's right, what's wrong, and everything, it, it gets immediately influenced by this, your visual cues have been artificially uh, manipulated by this sort of thing, and uh, in a sense, you, your brain has been hijacked. Well, there's uh, all kinds of examples of this uh, from the neurologic uh, literature. We talked about them yesterday with the visual disorder. We talked about them uh, 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 we're, we're in the somatosensory domain. We, talk, we've we can talk about them in emotional domain. And the notion is that uh, your brain can basically be sending out a message, and it doesn't get sent to the interpreter that there is an error in your processing system. 
if, because if you have a lesion, the information is not getting into an interpreter, so you get into a bizarre uh, situation. And one of the ones that's very common is when you have a right parietal lesion, uh, there's one of your domain monitors goes down, and here's a typical, you deny, you deny illness, you deny that your left hand is yours. It's a very common clinical phenomenon. And the question is, when you first see one of these patients, you think, well, that's crazy. I mean, they're crazy. I mean, what's wrong? I mean, that's obviously the doctor's holding up their hand. It's their hand. But if the system inside your head doesn't think there's anything wrong, then your interpreter is sitting there with no cue about anything that's going on in the room. And so what happens is, the, uh, this is an actual uh, dialogue from a patient uh, published by uh, Ramachandran. Patient, uh, doctor, whose hand is this pointing at her own left hand? She sees her hand there, but she has this lesion and she denies there's anything here. Whose hand is this? Doctor says, well, whose hand do you think it is? Patient says, well, it certainly isn't yours. And the doctor says, well, then whose is it? And the patient says, it isn't mine either. Doctor, well, whose hand do you think it is? And the patient says, well, it's my son's hand. Now, that sounds crazy, but it's, the interpreter is getting bad information, so it's a perfectly reasonable conclusion to come to given the information and the lesion that's been uh, invoked inside the head. So there's examples from uh, the emotional sphere. This is a very common uh, uh, thing. There's a, there are reports now that uh, you know, half of New York City is on Prozac. And what happens is that it's an uh, anxiety-reducing drug. So what happens is that when people are walking down the street and they're on Prozac and they see they would have seen as a menacing situation coming towards them, they now don't. Oh, it's, uh, everything's fine, the world's wonderful. So what happens? ER admissions go up for muggings and, and, and all the like. You've clipped the system that cues you. The interpreter is not getting that information anymore, so it makes a different interpretation of the world, and so on. You can see how it goes. So, in moment to moment, activity. This, this interpreter is always dealing with this changing sight in the brain as to where uh, conscious activity is going on. And this is the work of uh, Matt Roser here now at the Plymouth University. He was in the lab for several years, a uh, student of Michael, po uh, Michael uh, Corbalis's from New Zealand, wonderful man. Uh, and uh, he's pointed out that in trying to understand this classic illusion uh, of uh, Michaud's uh, causal uh, uh, balls, they're called Michaud's balls, uh, he, he, he points out the following, that if you take the phenomenon uh, that uh, a ball coming across and hitting another, making it look like it, it impels, uh, compels the next ball, uh, we all see that, and then you start breaking it apart, and you make it so the ball doesn't quite hit the other one, and then you temporarily do it so that the ball hits and then it's a little bit of time before the other ball moves. You, you break apart the illusion. When you do that experimentally, you find out that the uh, right hemisphere is the one that succumbs. The right hemisphere is the only one that sees these illusions and they're the only ones that deteriorate as you break it apart by, the, by this way of, of uh, uh, creating the spatial discontinuity and the temporal discontinuity. So what does that mean? He compared that then to uh, this task where you're given this and your uh, task and you're trying to infer uh, which uh, is the answer to what makes the bottom uh, box light up. And of course, if you follow that through, you will notice that it has to be a green a line has to be part of it. The right hemisphere can't do that task. It just simply can't do it. The left hemisphere does that task, lickety split, it's easy to do. So what do, you, what do you have? As we sit here in the room, and if we had time to go through these in greater detail, as you see your ability to compute the one phi phenomenon, uh, the balls hitting each other and impelling, that's your right hemisphere. And then uh, next I give you a task that involves uh, in, uh, causal inference, uh, that's your left hemisphere. So you can just see that where your brain activity is dominating your sense of consciousness at any given moment, is constantly being pushed and pulled by the fact that these things are uh, distributed in different places, but we just blend them together. So 
let, let me get, let me go on to the next one. So, so now we come to a, uh, we're almost at the end of tonight's uh, effort. Uh, we come to a, an extraordinary situation, and that is the, a few of the split brain patients developed uh, the ability to say simple words out of their right hemisphere as well as their talking left hemisphere. And so uh, this came as a great surprise to us. It wasn't expected, and, and not all, every patient has done it. But the ones that do, uh, you get the following phenomenon. You, you flash a picture of a fork and a key, as you see here, and what did you see? And all of a sudden, instead of just them saying uh, fork, because that's the one going in the left hemisphere, they say fork and key. And you go, oh, whoa, what's going on here? So first of all, you want to know again whether they're transferring information or is it actually speech coming out of each hemisphere? And so you say, okay, don't tell me what you see. Tell me whether they're same or different. Very simple task, just self-evident. They can't do that task. So you, through a bunch of tests, figure out that, in fact, the left hemisphere, of course, continues to speak, and now the right hemisphere can throw a word in the soup, as it were. So uh, we began to do some tests that really showed how quickly you adapt and the interpreter just takes information wherever it's getting it and sp sp uh, spins it into a story. So in this, what we call a triple story test, we flash words, Marianne may come visit into the township today. And if you look within a visual field, it also makes sense, Mary may visit the ship. And if you look in the right visual field, left hemisphere, Anne come into town today. So every way you read this story, there, it makes sense. What does the patient say they see? So the left hemisphere saw Anne come into town today. The right hemisphere actually saw Mary may visit the ship. But we now ask the patient about it. We say, we say to the patient, uh, our PS says, Anne, come into town today. Anything else? Here comes the right hemisphere. On a ship. Who? Ma. What? To visit. What else? To see Mary Ann. Now repeat the whole story. Ma ought to come into town today to visit Mary Ann on the boat. So he, he, he's just grabbing it, you know, and throw it in there and make it part of the general story. Here's another one. We flash to the right hemisphere a picture of a, uh, a, a, a toy wagon, as you see here. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, the patient says, toy, answers it. That's new. Well, you know, you're not supposed to do that. That's the left hemisphere that does that. Well, so we say, after we interview the patient, what, what, why does toy come to mind? He says, I don't know. The only thing that comes to mind, the first thing that bangs into my head. Well, does it kind of look like a toy? Yeah, that is what it feels like. It is almost like an inner sense tells you. How often do you go with the inner sense and how often do you go with what things look like? If I can't really tell what something looks like, first thing I say what is the first thing that I just go with that, the first thing that pops into my head. So here's, this is all left hemisphere talking and he's trying to gather insight why toy came out of his mouth but we know that came from the right, the right hemisphere. And this is all by way of saying that once you get onto this, you can see why all these constellation of modules can be contributing to behavior and we weave it together into a story of uh, unity. And the final example here on this is, uh, again, this is patient VP and we're uh, giving her what we call a split word test in that uh, we flash one word to one hemisphere and another word to the other that if combined would make a word and so the first example you're going to see is she's going to see the word break and, and fast. Break and fast, right? And uh, so is she going to say, like you and I would say, breakfast? Or is she going to say break and fast? Or is she going to then cure herself and try to correct herself? Let me show you the video and you can see for yourself what she does. Just go ahead and say that first. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is Dale supposed to make a word? No. It doesn't necessarily? It doesn't won't necessarily. So, okay. like for example, with honeymoon, if you saw moon, moon first, just go ahead and say moon, honey. Okay. Doesn't I am, okay. I never, that hasn't happened yet. Okay. If, if it does, I if surely does. will. Okay. Mm-hmm. Break. Break. Break and fast. Okay.
Okay, so you saw what she did. She, she said break, but her other hemisphere saw the word was fast, and so she quickly calculated that she probably should have pronounced that breck, and she corrected herself, and so forth. So you can see the, the incredible quickness of self-cueing to try to pull things together into a, a common narrative. So to summarize then, uh, here's what I would, would consider the current view, that, that consciousness does not con constitute a single generalized process. It is an emergent property that arises locally out of hundreds if not thousands of widely distributed, distributed specialized systems. From moment to moment, different modules or systems complete compete for attention and the winner serves as the neural system underlying that moment of conscious experience. We do not experience a thousand chattering voices, but a unified experience. Consciousness flows easily and naturally from one moment to the next with a single unified and coherent narrative. The psychological unity we experience merges out of a particular specialized system called the interpreter. The interpreter appears to be uniquely human and specialized to the left hemisphere it is the trigger for human whoop, for uh, uh, human beliefs which constrain our brain. Now, the implications for this, if you think about them and it settles in, and uh, hopefully by Monday you'll come back loaded for bear, implications for personal responsibility and our moral compass, the problem of free will and determinism. The interpreter allows us to have our own theory, but what does it mean when we're saying we seem to build our theory after the fact, that the brain's already done it, and then we build a story about its meaning and our role in it. And the importance and impact of that on these uh, larger questions of uh, free will and determinism uh, and personal responsibility will be tackled uh, on uh, Monday. So thank you very much. Two roving microphones. Uh, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand so that uh, those who are carrying the microphones can identify you. There's a lady in the second front row on my right, and then there are Brian Smith on the left there, and somebody right at the back is looking for a microphone. We've got lots of hands. Let's begin with the first question. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Um, I'm very, my name's Joe Hilton. I'm very interested in metaphor. So if you were offering a metaphor for all this, would, be, would, would we be more like a jazz band or an orchestra? Oh. Huh. Uh, more like a jazz band than an orchestra. So help me with, uh, how, how big is the jazz band? <laughs> I, 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 I would think it's more of an orchestra size. Yeah, just to, if, if you're looking, I mean, I, no I one has the faintest idea how many. I suppose I wasn't just thinking of size. I was thinking of a jazz band might not have a leader and an orchestra might have a conductor. So I, I suppose right. if you could have an infinite <coughs> jazz band and an infinite orchestra. Oh, uh, very nice, thank you. Uh, jazz band. <laughs> Although, you know, Les Paul, did you ever notice he does that little thing, you know? Isn't he directing the whole thing with that little finger movement? I mean, I don't know. Anyway, I've always been fascinated with Les Paul. I mean, just a, a very elementary question arising from the interesting case you gave about Mary and Anne and the ship and the town and the conversation that your experimenter had with the person on whom the experimenter was, experiment was conducted. Yes. I mean, in one sense, one can argue in a bit that sort of consciousness can take shape from shared conversation between um, human beings. What happens if you have two people who are being experimented on by that method that you put and invite them to have a conversation together about how they're describing Mary Ann, the ship and the town, etc. Not yeah. a conversation between the yeah. experimenter and the experimentee, yeah. but between the two experimentees yeah. trying to get a coherent picture about what they've been presented with. Well, I think it's fair enough, and I think you would find similar phenomena. You know, it's a well-known phenomenon that 
I, I don't, well, let me take a stab at this, that uh, group decisions are better than single decisions. Uh, that uh, they're more thorough, they're more accurate, they're more this, they're more that. And whether the, the exchange of information just leads to a richer characterization of whatever's being thought about uh, uh, is, is, uh, at, uh, is at play. But I would think that you could probably analyze the conversation for two people and see that they are pulling together and coming up with a, uh, some kind of, well, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I'm, go, I'm going to put that one on the back burner. Yeah, I, I saw someone right at the very back. There's two here. It's a good question. Yes. Hello, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor, for these very interesting lectures. Um, my question has to do with uh, sort of um, the universal nature of, of what the hemispheres are, are doing, how they're sort of split for everybody, it seems. Uh, what does this mean for those of us, the, the small majority of, of uh, or a small minority, rather, of left-handers, uh, because we're using our, our, our right hemisphere to control something to, to create language. Is that, does that mean that we have hyperactive corpus callosums that are constantly com you know, uh, ferrying this message back and forth? Or can we also find some elements, like you, you mentioned, of uh, speech and language in the right hemisphere? Thank you. Well, the, the, uh, a large body of research addresses that. Uh, in, te in fact, 40% of left-handers have their language in their left hemisphere anyway. 40% have it in the right, and 20% of them have it shared. They're bilaterally organized. So the, uh, whereas in right-handers, 97, 98% of them have it in the left hemisphere. 99% is huge. Actually, people argue about those little percents, but, but, uh, but it's a complete, complete difference. So I, how it gets distributed, instantiated, and how that was influenced by the hand in this question, uh, overall, uh, I don't think is that important. It's that they are, there are specific networks carrying out a particular cognitive function. And it's had, as it's sorted out by the, in this hemisphere way is just the way it did, but I, I don't think that is of, of a crucial importance, actually. Okay, another one from the back, and then two here from the front. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my question is loosely related to the question before uh, handedness about uh, two experimenters talking. Mm -hmm. um, you know how you said uh, we discussed the idea of uh, consciousness being spread across different processes in the brain or different systems in the brain? Would you think that we could extend this idea to different brains? So different systems in different brains, maybe consciousness is a very difficult word to deal with, uh, sharing information, pros uh, performing sub-processes and uh, coming to a conclusion or a state of information or a decision about their state. You're going to love lecture five. <laughs> we, get, we get to those very questions. And there's a, a lot of new research that uh, you, will, you will find fascinating, but I'll be damned if I'm going to give it away now. <laughs> so, fair enough. Uh, fourth row, and then the second row at the front. Given that the main modality you're testing here is speech, is it possible that rather than an interpreter, what you're measuring is just the, the specific area or system in the left brain that's speaking and how it's interpreting the rest of the, of the activity in the brain. Well, it, I guess the, uh, in, tasks, it matter? in tasks that would elicit the interpretive function, the only hemisphere that follows through and interprets is the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere doesn't do it. Now the question is, is it a separate function from the actual language and speech system? Uh, that general question I tend to think is yes. I think there are separate modules and, and I look at, at uh, language and speech as a sort of a press agent to, the, to those other processes. But that's a h highly uh, controversial and debated issue and, and not the answer is not known. But you, you can, uh, 
I mean, you know, in, in an Alzheimer's patient, if you just take a simple clinical example, as, you, as the dementia increases, or progresses, I, I should say, there's a striking disparity between uh, conversational language and ability to think. So you, can, you see the systems are dissociable rather easily. Thank you. Mike's still allowed to take that up just for a second. But, so just to follow that, I'm wondering about, I mean, do you really need the interpreter? Or could you just make do with different patterns of top-down flow of information and a brain that is just sort of driven to try and model the data? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the interpreter sounds like a very active thing. Is he doing something very special? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's trying to figure out the meaning by looking at the patterns. And so I think that's what it's doing, and all this stuff that I'm describing just comes along. It's kind of a marker of that more basic function. That, that's how I think about it. Uh, professor, using your model of the interpreter being housed in the left brain, how would you interpret the experience of, of Jill Bolt Taylor after her stroke? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, uh, he's referring to a uh, woman who, who wrote a, uh, a lovely book about her experience with, with stroke. Uh, you know, you, you would just have to get down to the particular lesion, the individual variation in her organ, brain organization and what, how the lesion impacted that organization. There are lots of details one would have to know to fully interpret uh, her interpretation. Uh, on the surface, there's a conflict, and that's what you're pointing out, and uh, I understand that, but there's so much variation in the, in the individual brain organizations, which we'll be talking about on Monday, that uh, any particular summary lesion just cannot predict what a particular patient will do. So I, 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 I it's a long way of saying I, I don't know how to explain her observation. Okay, we, we, we have um, m many more people wanting to ask questions and we have time, but th there are three people who've been uh, raising their hands for some minutes and we'll, we'll take those questions and uh, then I think we might ask Professor Gazaniga to sum up. So there's, there's somebody on my right hand side about the middle of the hall, there's a gentleman in the third row and then in the front row. Hi, at the end of the talk you mentioned that the interpreters are uh, unique to humans. I'm just wondering what uh, specifically led you to that conclusion? Well, um, uh, it's specific to left hemispheres uh, even. Uh, the, the right hemisphere doesn't seem to have one. And uh, if you look at the cognitive of life of uh, the chimp, the chimp can think about things that are in their uh, our, our closest relative uh, can think about uh, matters that are directly in their perceptual sphere, but they can't see the underlying uh, patterns or, or possible physics that could be applying to the thing that they're actually seeing. So uh, they're not uh, 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 they, they're not very good at interpreting the world. They are they're only good at understanding the perceptual world as it actually appears to them and, man and manipulate those variables. Now there's, there's uh, individual exceptions, but as we pointed out in the first uh, lecture, the summary of Premack, when you get uh, David Premack, who has spent his life working with chimps, is that uh, they they're have adaptations to solve particular problems, but they don't have this general ability to cross link information, and I think the in in interpreter there would, would be key in that skill. Exactly how it works uh, is not known by a long shot, but that would be my general answer. Thanks. I apologize for asking this very simple question, but does division of the corpus callosum cure the patient's epilepsy? Yes. It, uh, with, combined with the medication, uh, uh, it has done the job on, uh, uh, on wellness on, uh, I would say, the vast majority of these patients. There are a couple exceptions here and there, but yes. Does it prevent radiation from one hemisphere to the other? The, uh, that was the uh, original idea, of course, and uh, one, 
one interpretation is uh, you would therefore see, you, you, why wouldn't you see just as many seizures but unilateral, those kind of, uh, and you don't, you, you just don't see seizures. And so the, the notion is that by cutting the callosum, you've raised the threshold of firing in each hemisphere and you just don't get it. Uh, the, the callosum in some, say was, some way was facilitating and lowering the seizure threshold so that you, you were getting more seizures. That wasn't the original idea to the experiment, uh, the surgery. Uh, the original idea was just to localize it. But uh, since the, the sort of the assistance is given uh, in stopping the seizures, I think there's other explanations are better now. Final question. Yes, sir. You seem to associate pattern recognition with the right brain. Um, that um, would be illustrated by the rare example you gave of the written word of some patients uh, that um, seem to have right brain writing. Yeah. On the other hand, writing seems to be closely parallel to speaking yeah. and the left brain activities. Yeah. Are, is there anything significant in that distinction? Uh, have you learned anything particularly um, significant that shows up a fundamental difference as to whether the experiments are cast with a prejudice towards speaking or in terms of speaking mm -hmm. as against in terms of writing? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the uh, uh, capacity of these uh, uh, patients to write from the right hemisphere is in itself astounding, given what we know about where writing centers are from standard neurology. And uh, they turn out, as you, if you look over the whole uh, uh, population of these patients, uh, it's the minority of them that have these capacities in the right hemisphere. Turns out we study them heavily because they're so interesting and they do all these things and then we look for the effects on larger questions. But many, many split brain patients with the cannot write out of the right hand, have no understanding of language, cannot read, and so forth and so on. So it in a way it gives a, and I should have, I should have put that caveat in, uh, you, you obviously understand the neurologic literature. Uh, uh, we, we're going beyond those points and trying to look at the, these larger questions of, of consciousness and what's responsible and so forth. So uh, uh, to go, come back to your point, uh, I don't know. It may be the, the, the incidence of language and writing capacity in the right hemisphere uh, is a little higher in these patients than you would expect from just reading the neurologic literature, but it's not suggesting that this is a bilateral skill at all. Uh, it is still highly lateralized. Now, does it bias things? Um, you know, the whole... Uh, the whole agenda in split brain research is to test each, each hemisphere individually and to make sure you're not getting transfer between the hemispheres and to see what its skills are as an individual neurologic system. So we, we can just, we can test a hemisphere on its terms. If it can't write or speak, we have nonverbal ways of doing it. If it can, we can tap into those. So uh, I, I don't think we're caught in any, any uh, systematic bias here, but anyway. Thank you. Well, I thank you all for your attendance, your attention, and for the questions <laughs> we've had. And I know you will want me to express our appreciation to Professor Gazaniga for this third in the series. Uh, he now has a, a break of a few days and the series continues on Monday at 5.30 here in the Playfair Library. The title is Free Yet Determined and Constrained. You're all very welcome, but for tonight we say thank you once again to our Gifford lecturer. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.